Right here with this parking lot at, down a little farther. The house used to be about Hanway, Brush, and, and John Island. We used to get anywhere, like I said, 150,000 to 150,000, 150 to 150,000 a day in one single house on this block here. police used to stand, used to station, try to catch us dropping it off. And we were selling so much drugs that we weren't having it drop it off. We used to drop it off in keys and mix, mix it upstairs and send the package downstairs because it would be too much transfer bringing it back and forth. Wow. We would make one drop, all we did was just pick up money. Okay. Mm -hmm. Left on this block. Mm -hmm. It would be one drop, and all we did was just pick up. All right, this lot right here is where Eddie had a building. I think it was about four. Four floors in this building. And we used to stash a lot of stuff in this building. This is back in the 70s. But after Eddie came home from jail, after he did his first bit, he, uh, I wasn't too close around him. I was doing business with him, but I wasn't as close to him as I was at first. And an uh, uh, agent had moved into this building and got close to the family and everything. But Eddie had a good, he had a good sense about feeling people. When he first saw this guy, he had just that mission. See, that guy is, a, is an FBI agent, so he's an agent. But anyway, Eddie still, we understand, you know, went past that and everything. And the guy had got to be real close. And uh, he has tried to do some business with Eddie, but he just still kept it cordial with him and everything. But anyway, Eddie was so wild when he came back from the first bit. You know, Eddie, he never did really respect the police even from, the, from day one, you understand? So he had got so hot, they had every phone booth on Hamilton from here all the way down to the large, down to uh, Calvary, because that's where he was going, making his uh, phone calls, hooking up, you know, with his peoples and stuff. And they had every phone booth on Hamilton bugged. And, and like I say, he knew he had a feeling that agent went right, but anyway, he went past that, and that's he got. To, he caught the second case, and I went to jail on the second case myself, because you understand they had a conversation with me and him talking in a car. So they had all our cars bugged, and you know, and like I say, that's how I got caught up the second, the second, the second case that Eddie had. Now was that thirty-two man case? That was no, that was the first case. The oh. second case, you understand? But I see, I had a, another case. Uh, after the, uh, the, that was the third case, for, uh, second case with me, but it was, uh, I, went Ed, well, I went with Eddie on the second case with me, you understand? The first case I had, that's when I went to jail in 83, when I got in down here. Gotcha. You understand? But uh, like I say, Eddie, you understand, he went to jail and came out, and he went right back in. He came home, he went in in 76, and he came out in 83, and I think he went back in in 85. So now I'm a transition, and we were talking about Pep. You and Pep. Oh yeah, Pep. I met Pep in jail, cause me and Pep was in the same case with Eddie, and I met Pep. You understand? In jail, and I come to find out. You understand? Pep is, is a stand-up guy. Me and him got to be real close. You understand? Because when he uh, went to jail, me and him got closer. He went to telling me about. Niggas thought he was snitching and all that. And I told him, and me and him, you understand, we made, I made we, we did that bit together. 
And like I said, he come to find out, you understand, all that shit with number talk. Pep, you understand, they ain't never said nothing about nobody because I was on the same case with him, you understand. And I talked to Pep to this day. You can't find no better person than Pep. Pep was my man. Bound by glory, torn by greed. That's his book. Yeah. Check it out. This is Big Boss Filmworks. I'm Lou. And this is The Black Dispatch. Much respect. We got a couple more stops on our tour of Motown Mafia. 10 year anniversary of the film. And the next stop, Butch. We're going to Hamilton the Six Mile. We're on Six Mile in Hamilton. This is one of the buildings that me and Eddie had back in the 70s. This right here was a key location. When I used to go to New York you understand, and bring the package in, this is one of the first stops I would make in this building. This is where we would just stand stashing after I get through packaging it and everything. We used to just stand, hide it in the basement in this building here. And like I say, you understand, I mean, this building here then, Hey, we just stored so much drugs in the basement of this building over the years, from the 60s up until 76, you understand? You wouldn't believe it. I'm talking about millions and millions of dollars of drugs that were stashed in this basement, in this building on Hamilton, and it's, it's six miles. This is one of the buildings that, it, that we had. This is a beautiful building right here, but we went to some spots that are no longer there, like have been decimated, that the crack here, destroy that area, that whole Paradise Valley before it, you know, it's got bought up and give, give me your take on the, what uh, you crack, on that, the crack, that the crack question, epidemic. That question that you just asked me, Stan, that's the truth. You know, let me tell you something, back in the day when we were selling millions and millions of dollars of drugs, it was no bill, it was, it was no vacant fields nowhere. That thing that started happening, then when that crack, you stand hit the streets, which was in the 78, that's when that shit, you understand, started to happen. I'm talking about, you understand, they was burning down more, you understand, in the crack. They was burning down property, everything. All kind of crimes started happening, you understand, when that crack came out, you understand, because that crack destroyed the whole city of Detroit, not just Detroit, all over the country. Anywhere you go where, where drugs is at, you understand, you, we got the same problem, you understand, vacant fields and everything. Crack burnt down the whole world. The whole world. Yeah, crack the is the worst thing that ever came out. It really was. I just had to make a speech on this building here. This building right here, I'm just showing you how good it is some good hearted people in this world. Gene Moore used to own this building. It didn't look like this here when Gene had it. But I just had to stop here and mention this to you because Courtney, Courtney Brown, you understand here, just got out of jail. Ain't? Mr. Ryan caught another case, and he was living in this building before he went to jail. He was in jail for about seven years. Gene kept his apartment till the day he got out. I mean, did no one go in that apartment from the whole while Courtney was locked up until the day he got out. You understand? And you tell me about a person like that. That's the way Mr. Wo that's the way Mr. Moore worked. You understand? And this speaks for itself. If you know. Just a little things about him, you'll know what type of person he is. Gene Moore. That's man, my man. Guy. He's one of a kind. And strictly business. Strictly business. If you uh if you all get a check chance to check it out, we did a uh, a piece on Mr. Moore. It's called The Man Who Owns Detroit. Check it out, Big Boss Film Work. And uh, hopefully we can score an interview with him soon. All right, much love, people. We covered ground today, baby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't, I don't mind working with you. All right. <laughs> she was the first person that got caught a case with him. She got busted in New York on the airplane. And like I say, you understand, they damn near tortured that woman, you understand, tried to get her to talk on him, and she never did give, she never did break.
When you go through the neighborhood, do you ever ask yourself why you see so few black-owned businesses? I think we have gotten away from it to a certain extent. Uh, but I know based on the way I was raised, we need to start coming back to that place. Giving them the resources that they need in order to make change. Um, we do a lot of community advocacy. We go clean up the houses and the streets if need be. Um, we just want to be a group that people can rely on, can count on, um, who can support the city. I always want to be an entrepreneur, you know, I always wanted my own business and I always was looking for different ideas and things to do. People know these stories. You know black men who own businesses. You know black men who take care of their families. You know black men who go to work every day and do their fair share to build their communities. It's an interesting, it's a long, it's a tedious, and it's a difficult process, but it was good for us and it allowed us to grow as a brand because it made us really have an internal look at what we're doing. So we came here to talk about, you know, getting your mind right so you can get your money right.